Cheers. How's everyone doing tonight? Come on, if you love the Lord, you can go ahead and clap your hands. day 
all day just seeking after him. Hey, man, you can have your seats real quick. Just a couple announcements. But before we do, I didn't notice any who came in, but is there any first-time visitors? All righty. Second time? That's all right. I guess we got to go get them. Come on. Come on. We got to go get them. So tomorrow afternoon, 5 p.m., meet here, and then we're going to go get them. We're going to get all the first-time visitors. And not for our glory, not for our namesake, not for the remnant, not for Modesto Church, not for this building, but for who? For who? Yes. Amen. We got to go out there. Someone reached out to us. Let's reach out for others. Amen. 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 And also, Sunday morning, we'll invite them out once you go to the outreach. The next day is Sunday morning service. The outpouring of God. The outpouring of his presence starts at 10. You guys know what time it starts. What time is prayer? What time is prayer? What time is prayer? Yes. Okay. You guys all know now. <laughs> and then the service starts at 11. We all know that. Amen. And also, we're so excited. The, anticipa the anticipation is very, very exciting. Seven-day revival. Yes. Seven days. That's all the days of the week. Every single day, you have an opportunity to have a corporate worship, to let the power of God fall like he does every service. But this one might be special. It is. That's what Pastor Levi said. Yes, amen, amen. It's going to be next Sunday. Next Sunday, two services, and just bug people. Just bug them. Let them get kind of annoyed, like, all right, I'll go, I'll go. Bug them. Bug them to go. Your family members, your coworkers, people on the streets, people in the grocery stores or whatever. Just bug them. Let them see your excitement. And if you're not excited, get excited. Just tell someone about it and smile, amen? So, yeah, next Sunday, it's going to start. It's going to last a whole week, maybe more. Who knows? Only the Lord knows, amen? Amen. Okay, I think that's all the announcements. Let me double check here. Okay, awesome. All righty, and then I just... Real quick for the tithes and offering, um, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25, it is, it said, it, uh, the scriptures say this, it is a snare to the man who devours that which is holy, and after vows to make an inquiry. It is a snare to the man who devours that which is holy, then after vows to make an inquiry. I was like, what does that mean? I know the first part is like, it's, it's, it's a trap. For us to devour the tithes and offering, which is holy unto the Lord. And we ought not to touch that, not even get close to it, but just give our tithes and offering to the Lord. And then the second part, I didn't really get until the Lord showed me. After vows to make an inquiry, and the Lord showed me real, he showed me a greedy person, and spiritually, that someone who goes, oh, I'm not going to pay my tithes and offering today. I'm not going to pay it. And, and then inquire, I, I wonder if the Lord's going to punish me today if I'm not going to pay my tithes and offering. I wonder if he's going to, um, you know, understand or have mercy, like see where I'm at. And you start inquiring on the next week and then the, nothing happens to you and you're all just well off and, and you're getting blessed and everything. And you're like, okay. And you're constantly thinking about that tithes and offering that you did not pay, that you devoured. It's a trap. It's a trap. And here's a trap. Whoever devours what's the Lord's are the wicked people. And the scriptures say the Lord delivers, many are the affliction of the righteous, and the Lord delivers them out of them all, but of the righteous, not the wicked. So if we, who are followers of Jesus, in devouring his tithes and offering, you go, we got to repent. We got to repent. We can't just give God our leftovers. Because that, that leftover is evident of us devouring his holy things. So just keep that in consideration. I pray and ask God to convict all of us to give more. Yeah, our tithes are awesome, but give more offerings unto the Lord. Amen? So if we could have the ushers come forward.
Every head bowed. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord God, thanking you for this opportunity, Lord God, to be in your presence, to hear from you, Lord God. And right now we pray and ask, Lord God, that you begin to do something new, Lord God, in the tithes and offerings of your children, Lord God. I pray and ask that you just begin to do something new, whether it be to cut off things that they're spending on, Lord, or increase the things that they're investing according to your word, Lord. And we just pray and ask that you just do something new tonight in their finances, Father God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
This is my surrender, this is my surrender. that there is a war going on right now. There is a war for you, for your family. And God is saying it's, it's a simple thing to win this war and that's just surrender. Simple. He said, I need you at my altar today. I need you at my altar. I need you to lay it all down for me. Because we are standing in times where all we need is Jesus. All we need to breathe is Jesus. All we need to think is Jesus. And if you're distracted by this world, he said, you come to my altar and you surrender it to me this, this night.
song begins to shout out how good he is, how faithful he is. Come on. Come on, begin to declare the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, don't stop. Come on, don't stop. This is your moment right here. Come on, begin to connect with heaven. Begin to connect with the Holy Spirit. Begin to prophesy, even though something seems like it's not. Begin to prophesy, though it is. Come on, let loose. Come on. Begin to connect with heaven tonight. Whoa. Come on, don't stop. Come on, don't stop. Come on. As it is in heaven, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Come on, prophesy tonight. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, he's doing something. He's doing something. He's looking for men and women to declare the works of the Lord. Can you declare it? Can you perceive it? Do you feel it? Do you believe it? Is there unbelief? Begin to cast it out and let faith begin to move. Let faith begin to lead you. Faith is the substance. Let me tell you, if you can't see the good in what God is doing, then maybe we just don't believe like we should. It's the faith is the substance that we're missing. It's something hoped for and the evidence not seen. But that does not mean you and I can't stand in the power of the Holy Ghost and declare, begin to declare salvation over your household. Begin to declare healing over your body in the name of Jesus. Begin to declare salvation over our city, over our nation, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. He's already working. He's already working on your behalf. Maybe we just forgot. I don't know. But I remember it says in his word that he died on the cross for you and I in our filthiness, in our transgressions. And by his stripes, we are healed. Not only did he die, but he also rose on the third day. And he hasn't left you or me comfortless. He gave us a comforter. Whoa, it's already done. Come on, it's already been performed. Hallelujah. If you're at home watching, begin to declare over your household right there in your room. Let the Shekinah glory, the Kabod glory fill your house. Whoa, come on. He's working. He's working. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Whoa. Whoa. Come on, somebody in this place, just give them a shout of praise. Come on. Come on. Has he found a people willing to partner with him? Is there a people in this time, in this church, that are connected to heaven? Come on, what is heaven's perspective? Oh, I don't know about you, but I can feel the rain. I said, I don't know about you. I believe you You understand what I'm saying. I can feel the rain. And Zacharias says, ask for rain in the time of rain. Why would he say that? Because it's been raining since the book of Acts, chapter 2, when it was prophesied in the book of Joel. But it's here tonight, but you and I must ask for it to receive it. We have not because we ask not. He's not talking about your cars. He's not talking about your job. He's not talking about what you're going to eat. He's talking about revival being poured out in the last days, healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. That's what he's saying, but that's not our will. That's the will of the Father for your life. I don't know about you, but I can't help but prophesy. I can't help but declare what God has done in my life, how good he is. God is faithful. The gift of being able to prophesy or prophecy 
is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Every believer has a gift to prophesy, to declare how good God is, to declare the word of the Lord, to declare what God is speaking to you. Let those that have ears, let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the church. Could I tell you, God is speaking. But has he found a, a man and a woman willing to declare and prophesy it? You see, because we know it's been declared, it's been settled, it's been established in the heavens, but it can't be delivered. And we can't see what the Word of God says until men and women are willing to stand in the gap and proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. Unwavering, not being tossed back and forth, to and fro, because our situation doesn't change. Well, I'm not sure if you are who you say you are, Lord. That's the double-mindedness of the world that has crept into the church and has choked out the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is why things ain't established. Well, I'm in dry land. Well, cold down for, for rain. I, I, I want to dig some ditches and begin to hit the water, Lord. Every spirit-filled, Pentecostal, full gospel baptized in the Holy Ghost believer has a mandate from heaven to prophesy. You have a mandate to prophesy what God is speaking. The book of Acts, it says in chapter 2, we know, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. I don't know about you, but that's not speaking just about my children. I'm a son of God, too. There's men and women here, sons and daughters of God. He says, you are also called to prophesy. If you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, a true born-again believer, and not prophesying, can I tell you, you and I are living beneath our purpose. We're living beneath our purpose. God has called you to be the head and not the tail. He's called you to be above and not beneath. You and I are seated in heavenly places. This is why God's been speaking to me. Son, don't look at the world. Keep your eyes in heaven. Now I got an eternal. Now I got a heaven view. And now I can speak. Even though I don't see things changing, it's already going to change. God is going to work on your behalf and on my behalf. He's always heard the cry of the righteous. He's always heard the cry of those that were persecuted for his name's sake. God has called you and I to be the head and not the tail. Never forget that you are above and not beneath. You and I can, cannot fully be empowered witnesses if you and I do not declare or begin to prophesy. The true empowerment that, that means I have full belief in what the Word of God says. I'm not declaring my own thing. I'm declaring the Word of the Lord because it's written on the tablet of my heart. So I'm able to speak the Word of the Lord. I'm able to open up in my prayer time and begin to pray Scripture. It's already been declared, church. Why hasn't this happened? Why hasn't that happened? Because we're not willing to declare it. It's already been established. But it can never be delivered until he finds men and women willing to declare the truth. I'm not saying partial truth, because partial truth is a lie. The full truth. So you and I are anointed to be kings and priests. Revelation chapter 1 talks about you and I are called to be kings and priests. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. As priests, we pray and we worship God in heaven. Those empowered by the Holy Spirit, whether you sit in the office of a prophet or you have a gift of prophecy. You're able to hear what heaven has decided on and declare it. As kings, we rule and expand God's kingdom here on earth. He's given you all power and all authority to trample on every serpent. Some of us believe it. Some of us are still not sure. You want to live a victorious life? It's in Him. You and I must strongly desire to prophesy in these last days to come. So we can partnership with heaven. And we can be the voice that the Lord needs here on earth. And I know you and I understand this. Thank you, worship team. I know you and I understand this. 
John the Baptist. There was no greater prophet than John the Baptist. Come on, somebody, help me preach. And God has called his church, not just this church, but the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, to be a voice in the world, to prophesy. Amos chapter 3, one of my favorite books in the Bible. The lion has roared, who will not fear it? If a lion walked into this place, you and I would run crazy, frantic, stepping on people. I wouldn't care who I threw in front to eat first. I'm gone. Fear. That's just the, that's the natural reaction. But how many know we serve a supernatural God? So what is the supernatural action? Let me, let me read this. The sovereign Lord has spoken. Who cannot but prophesy? Meaning when God speaks to you in your prayer time, in, in the services, when you're, when you're under the unction of the Holy Ghost and God is speaking to you, how could you hold it in? The natural reaction is to prophesy, is to declare. But you see, that comes with belief. You and I will never declare if there's no belief in our life. You can, you can take a seat, I'm sorry. Some are already seated, so. Who can help but prophesy? Go with me really fast to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come before you, Lord, thanking you, Lord, for this time that we have in your service, Lord. I'm thankful, humble, Lord, to be, able to, to be able to preach your word, Father God, that I pray becomes engrafted in our lives and our minds, Father God, that it changes us forever, Lord. We are thankful, Lord. For who you are, we're thankful, God, for the warnings, God. We're thankful, Lord, for the judgment. The, we're thankful, for God, for the chastisement. We're thankful, God, for everything that you bring, Lord. Help us to be ready to receive your word tonight. Holy Spirit, speak through me. I can do nothing without you. I need your anointing, God. Break every yoke, break every mindset, break every bondage, every curse, God. Set us free, Lord. Make us more like you in this time, God, because we need it. We won't make it if we're not like you. We thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Has God been speaking to anybody? Is God speaking right now? Has God been speaking to anybody? Lady, do you understand what's taking place here? That there's things that you and I can read about. We can even pray about. God can even speak directly to you and I, but we don't see a change. Can I get it? Can I get it? Can you come and testify me on that? Things ain't changing. He's waiting for a man and a woman to just simply declare it with belief and prophesy. See, but what happens when we declare something and we prophesy something and we don't see it come to pass right away? It's kind of about us. Oh, so prideful. Oh, it didn't happen. I shouldn't have said that. So who's God? God's a liar? Because, it's, because you didn't get it when you wanted it? We still can't believe. I told you time and time again when God speaks to me, I don't care who's against me. When it's settled, it's settled. When it's established, it's established. Why? Because his word is settled and established in the heavens. So when God gives you a word, you should feel that strength, that power, that anointing inside of you. It's established and it's settled. And it will come to pass. First Corinthians chapter 14, speaking of prophecy. Listen to what it says here, because he says he's looking for our people. I can't help but prophesy. This has to become our call. This has to become who we are. I can't help but talk about the goodness of the Lord. Yes, amen. First Corinthians chapter 14, follow after love. Let love, everything that we do, love has to be the motivating factor behind why we do what we do. And I prayed to th this morning, all day I was in the prayer room. And I was with God seeking the Lord, and I had one song in the whole time, and it was draw me close to you. Never let me go. And I was asking the Lord because he released me to speak something tonight. And I asked the Lord, Lord, I don't want to preach like I used to preach. I don't want to deliver a word like I used to deliver a word. I want to change. I want this to be from a heart of gratitude and a heart of love for truth. Not because what I see, because I can use scripture and I know facts and so I can just go at it. But with love so it sticks. 
Because without compassion and love, nothing changes. Without compassion and love, there are no miracles. So when you and I be, begin to, 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 it says here, follow after love, things begin to change. Whether it's accepted or denied, things begin to change. Uh, follow after love the desire and desire spiritual gifts. He's telling you to covet, in a sense, to desire. Go after the spiritual gifts. They are ours. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit that you and I should work in. But rather that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in unknown tongues speaks unto men, but unto God. Speaks not unto men, but unto God. Speaking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost in, in tongues and heavenly language. For no man understands him. How about in the spirit he speaks mysteries? So this is, the, this is the spirit's language unto the Father. And there are perfect prayers for our life. But when we, when we speak in the heavenly language, yes, God is always working. It's 100% guaranteed. You'll never miss. And it's the will of God for your life according to the Father. But not everybody understands that. So there's gifts. But listen to this, but he who prophesies, like me speaking English right now, I'm prophesying, declaring the glory of the Lord to fill this temple, that the train of God, the, tr the train of his robe will fill this temple. People can understand that. But he who prophesies speaks unto men to edify or build up for exhortation or to implore and comfort or consolation. Now, the, the, the word implore here means urgency. It means actually petition. It even means to beg. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of the enemy trying to get a foothold on my life. Yeah. Trying to get a foothold on the church of Christ. And I've been praying urgently that God will destroy my adversary. That God will destroy my enemies. That every snare and trap that was placed for me or for you, they would fall it to it themselves. And we would see this come to pass now for the honor and the glory of the Lord, for truth's sake. Because there's people that are lost in deception, wavering, double-minded, not knowing if they're coming or going. They don't know the voice of the Lord. So those are the ones that I'm fighting for. So they can have a true experience with the Lord. Then they can make a decision. Because you and I have been taught the truth. There is no confusion in this church. Same chapter, verse 31, for you may prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be com comforted. Hallelujah. Isn't it comforting to, to prophesy the word of the Lord? To declare his word, his scriptures? Isn't it comforting? Doesn't it do something to the soul? You can't buy that. You can take a rock star. You can take steroids. You can do whatever you want, but it's going to leave you. But when you feed yourself the true living man and the true bread of life, there's something that transforms on the inside of your soul. This is what I'm talking about, engrafted. And don't think the devil's not going to come and try to mess you up, mess with your body, your mind, headaches, backaches, this and that and that and this. He's going to do whatever he can to stop us. No weapon formed against me. No weapon made by Satan himself or any wicked man on the planet will ever touch me. Ever. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Meaning there's order. When you prophesy, it's not by what I think and what I see, and this is what I'm going to say. That's not prophecy. It's according to the Holy Spirit. It's always directed according to his word. And there's order of when and who begins to prophesy and when they prophesy. Now, there's, a, there's an office of a prophet. The prophet is a call. It's a, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a position that God has called this man to become a part of. A prophet is different from prophecy. A prophet can prophesy, but those that have the gift of prophecy will never enter in sometimes to the, to the office of a prophet. The prophet is it, it, it's a position. But a gift of prophecy is for you and I to declare the works of the Lord. For you and I to declare heaven here on earth and truly believe it and see God go to work. For God is not an author. Here it is. God is not the author of confusion. And this is how you know the spirit of God or truth is present. Because I'm going to tell you right now, those that are here or that have been a part of this church, 
There is no confusion. If you're in tune with God, our pastor has preached righteousness, holiness, prayer, fasting in the word of the Lord, time and time and again. We have prayer revivals. I mean, what happens when things don't go right? You go to your knees. So we see things not taking place the way we like to see them. We see people get up and leave and take other people with them. So what do we do? We're doing three-day prayer revivals. Why? Because I can't help you, but the Father that I pray to can. So you better join me in prayer. This is what we need. Now what's the fruit of it? For we serve a God that is not an author of confusion, but peace. Do you have peace in your life? I've been asking the Lord, man, can you release me? I feel like I'm being quiet, but I, I, I feel this peace. This really, it's like a silent peace. Like, don't say nothing. Even sometimes when I'm, I'm talking to my wife, it's changing. Like, I'm not really responding like I used to. It's just different. God is telling me, Shh, don't say that. Shh, and it's, I can hear it clear. Who laughed with Dilly? I'm telling you, I can hear it clear. God is saying, don't speak. Don't, don't continue on that conversation. Oh, you ain't hearing me. That's going to save your bacon, couples. Don't continue on in that conversation. I'm not saying rebuke her. Just shut up. Be silent about it. And then her at, oh, should I not have said that? I'm like, I don't even know about that. I don't have a response for that. God just has me in this peaceful time. But when God is in the midst, there is peace. Let me ask you, is anybody confused in this place? Because we'll break it off you right now in the name of Jesus. I ain't playing. There should be peace in your life, peace in your marriage, peace in your ministry, peace in what God is doing. Why? Because he's the prince of peace. And we serve God. But peace as in all the churches of his saints. Now, there shouldn't be confusion. And now, three weeks ago, God gave me this word. Gave me this word, and I wrote it down. I'm sorry, I have notes here for this one, but it's real quick. God gave me a word in prayer. The last time I preached was on a Friday night. That, that Saturday morning, I went into prayer, went into the word, and God started delivering a word to me. And he's talking about the spirit of confusion. I see more people, now more than ever, confused and unsure. And I'm like, what have you been doing the whole 23 years of salvation? What have you been doing the whole 30 years of salvation? Like, we know the Bible, like Bishop Stephen Paul said, but we don't know the living word. Because we can quote scripture and because we can preach from this text and we know the background of this and the the background of that. Listen to what's happening here. Like every other disease that has come into the church because the church has accepted it. We didn't accept this coronavirus. We've accepted it. I'll just take the vaccin- vaccination. I'm vaccinated by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of my testimony. What? I'm not going to put a mask on my face so you can keep me shut up and keep me quiet. And then we come into the house, Lord, with the mask on so we can be. What if I was up here with the mask? Well, I can't speak. That's what the devil wants. He wants us to accept the church shutting up. See, but all the, there's other men and women that are okay with it because they're not of the bride of Christ. They're of a different spirit. So they push the agenda. Well, my church is open for vaccinations. Let me put a sign out there so I can get a so I, I can get an A plus with the city. So I can get a little donation. I can get some more money for my vacation time. Vaccinations open for the church. No, the only vaccination you're gonna get is salvation, baptizing the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Wash in the blood of the Lamb. Listen. Like every other sickness, God is telling me double-mindedness. Like every other disease has symptoms. Symptoms of double-mindedness. And we see that now more than ever. One of the symptoms is this instability. Instability with a double-minded man or a double-minded woman. Inconsistent. An alternative way. Not resolute. Wavering. Indeciding. Indecisive. Hesitating. 
to be and act one way today and be and act some other way tomorrow. Go to James chapter 1. We know what's happening here. James chapter 1. We'll just read verse 6. But let him ask, ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he who wavers is like a, a wave from the sea driven with the wind tossed. For let no man think whatever he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And God, I wrote this down in prayer. When, when the life is unstable, the mind is unsettled. And it lacks solid convictions. Let me say that again. When the life is unstable, the mind is unsettled and lacks solid convictions. This is why Jesus says, have this mind which is in Christ Jesus. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is through the word of the Lord. When a life is unstable, the mind is unsettled and lacks solid convictions. Could I tell you something? Our eyesight begins to change. Our vision begins to change. You ever had a migraine before? What happens when you have a terrible headache in your mind? The migraine comes, the vision goes. This is what double-mindedness is like. You have blurred vision, double vision, not sure where to go. Listen to what Proverbs 25 says. It's confidence. An unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. This is a double-minded person. Proverbs 25, verse 19. Confidence in unfaithful men in a time of trouble is like broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Pastor Robert said something. He preached a couple Sundays ago, and I wrote it down. That's, it probably was that Sunday when I wrote it down because it's here. But I know it was a couple Sundays ago. One of the things he said was this the first casualty of war because you and I are in a war. We are in a war. So you need to put your armor on every day. You need to be ready to go to war. You better be in the word of the Lord empowered by the Holy Spirit. Prophesying and declaring the goodness of God and victory over every situation. The first casualty in war is truth. Do you remember that service? Well, I wrote it down. That's the first, and that's what we see. We see truth leaving. It's another truth. Right? It's partial truth. Right? But what do we know? Because we're not in the Word, so whoever speaks over a pulpit or whoever speaks into your life, we just accept it as, oh, yeah, cool. You're right. You're right. You're right. Man, you've been pastoring for 40 years. You're right. You're right. How could I? You're right. No kind of understanding, no kind of discernment at all that God has given us through the Holy Spirit, a spirit of discernment. We don't use nothing. Go to Romans chapter 1. I'm just going to preach tonight because I haven't preached in a long time. Three weeks. Someone say too long. Thank you. A few of us. Everybody else is like, no, that's good. <laughs> Now, I, I, want, I want to give you an understanding here that God, re I think I might have t told you guys, I'm not even sure because, again, I haven't preached in such a long time, but God released something in the heavens. Did I tell you that? I said that God had released judgment upon the earth. And I seen for two days, Monday through two, on, on Monday and Tuesday, a war going on in the heavens. Now, from Wednesday to Saturday, there was no war. It was clear blue skies, no clouds at all. And I was asking the Lord, what happened to the war? He said, it's done, it's established, it's been settled. And so, obviously, God always wins. Yeah. But it was the Lord that released judgment. He told me, this son, there, there's wrath that is swelling inside me. Not judgment, wrath. There's a wrath that is swelling inside me. I'm getting pretty frustrated and pretty fed up with the church and with the world's way of living. Right? So what happens when wrath comes out? Well, the church will be gone. Yeah. So if wrath is swelling on the inside of the Lord, that means a rapture's around the corner. There's no post-tribulation here. I will be caught up 
in a twinkling of an eye in the sweet by and by. I will have a new body. I will take off the incorruptible and put on Jesus. And so he told me this, I'm releasing a spirit of torment. I'm releasing a spirit of torment upon unrighteousness. Those who call themselves righteous, but are unrighteous. I know the heart. I know the intent of the heart. So he says, I'm releasing a spirit of torment. Now listen to what I'm saying. Who's ever watching, doesn't matter. Listen to what I'm saying. God is saying the spirit of torment will be with you in your bed. Will be with you in your sleep. Will be with you in your shower. Will be with you at work. Will be with you when you wake up. Even those preaching false doctrines and doctrines of devils, when they walk on stage, the spirit of torment will even be with them there. Things will be, begin to be exposed at a, at a faster pace. Listen to what I'm saying. This is the word of the Lord. And then he takes me to scripture because he's so good. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, first the Jew and then the Greek. Glory to God. For wherein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith? It is written that the just shall live by faith, or the justified, the sanctified, shall live by faith. Won't you just write this down? We need to just live by faith because it's impossible to please the Lord without it. And if you've been justified and you've been sanctified and you've been saved and set free, then faith needs to become our first, our first and second step of life. Faith. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. He spoke to me concerning wrath. He said there was judgment released and a tormenting spirit. But he said he was swelling with wrath. What, what did he say here? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It was in the heavens that I seen it. And he said there will be signs and wonders in the heavens. My, but the, the whole thing is people ain't looking to the heavens. We're focused on the car in front of us going too slow. We're focused on going to the in and out and getting a 4 by 4 We're so focused on our vacation and our trips and our baseball games and our football games and everything. Even ministry. I got to get there and clock in so the pastor thinks I'm good. And you're missing the signs in the heavens. It's not just for one person, two people. It's for the sons and daughters of God. So you and I can begin to prophesy what God is doing. Righteousness of men who hold, listen to this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Whoo! See, so these men once knew the truth. He's speaking of the, the, the spirit of the Antichrist. He's speaking of those that are used by the devil himself. And what they do is since they know the truth, instead of releasing the truth to the people, they're used of a different spirit seeking to take your soul to hell. And so they don't release the truth. They compress it in their unrighteousness. That's, that's wicked. Someone say that's wicked. That's wickedness at the highest level. That somebody would tell you the truth about something and they knew the truth, they knew the answer, but yet they led you another way. That is wicked. This is why my prayer has been urgent. I want to see victory right now, Lord. I'm your son. I declare your word. Because that which was made known of God is manifest in them. For God had showed it unto them. There's, there's no excuse. They once knew. God shows us throughout creation. Even, even the, the atheists or those that don't want to believe. Creation cries out that there's a creator. That tells you there's something greater. Oh, there's a greater power. That's God. Go to Jude. <clears throat> one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's only one chapter, but I urge you to read it. I want to encourage you to read it. Is everybody okay with time? I'm, I'm preaching. 
So it's Friday night. I hope you guys are okay. Let's start here in Jude chapter 1. It's only one chapter, so chapter 1. We'll just start right here in the very beginning. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. amen. That is the greatest title you and I can have is servant of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to be known as, servant. Why do you think I was so excited when I started cleaning the restrooms when I first got saved? I was just serving the Lord. I'll pick up urine. I'll pick up toilet paper, moco paper, whatever it is. Wiping paper, I don't care what it was, I'll, I'll, take, I'll pick it all up for the honor and glory of the Lord. I had nobody looking at me, listening to me. It was all for Jesus. My Lord, I was excited. The servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James to them that are sanctified, someone say sanctified, by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. That's you and I. We've been sanctified. We've been preserved in Jesus Christ, but we've also been called. I can't help but prophesy. You've been called to declare the word of the Lord. I'm not saying it's going to be popular, but God's called you to, to declare it anyway. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Could I tell you something? When you're sanctified, when you're in Jesus, you're talking about mercy. You're talking about love. You're talking about peace being multiplied in your life, in my life. And I need it, especially right now. God knows what we need. Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. Someone say fight. 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 That's what it means. We, there's a war. There's a fighting that you and I must be, We have to be willing to fight. Do you understand? God's not going to share his anointing with the lazy person. Oh, so we, some of us like that. God is not going to share the anointing that breaks the yokes, that sex that kept us free with the lazy. He says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. And endurance and laziness is a complete separation. Just because we can sit in a chair and we can come here for years does not mean that we are on that fight, that we are on that path, that there is endurance. If that's the case, these chairs would go to heaven before us because they're more faithful than we are. For there are, verse 4, for there are certain men, someone say certain men. There are certain men that crept in unaware. Who were before the old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men. But isn't it crazy how it says they it crept into the church unaware. That tells you that there's, it's a certain somebody of high office, of, of high influence. Someone that maybe was a little more biblically studied than you and I. Someone that had the ways to speak. Someone that had the verbiage. Maybe he had the look. Maybe he had the car. Maybe he had the suit. I don't know. Something captured. He was, they were able to come in unnoticed by the church. Unaware. Ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. What does that mean? unrestrained behavior in any type of sin you can think for, think of. And that's what God's been speaking. The restraints have been, rele have been removed. Unrestrained behavior. And it's going to break it down for you. It's going to actually break down that word for you here, right here in a couple of scriptures. Watch. And denying the only God, our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved his people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now listen how he breaks down this word. Lasciviousness. Lasciviousness, however you say it. And the angels, which kept their first estate but left their own inhabitation. He's speaking about the angels of heaven. When they left and they came down and, and started committing sexual acts with, with human women here on the earth. So he's saying it doesn't matter if you're in heaven, if you're in the middle or beneath. Listen to what he says where the judgment's going to happen. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto judgment of that great day. Even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in the like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth, are set forth an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. 
So he's saying these men that have come in and crept into the church are ran by a different spirit. Are you getting this, church? Are you listening? Listen to it. Likewise. So now he says, okay, so I said all that, and like, like that, these men, likewise, this spirit in these men, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil dignities. So these men and women, they despise authority. And it's not man's authority because they love control. They love authority. It's not the spirit. not liking. He doesn't mind that. He doesn't want godly authority. He doesn't like godly dominion. The spirit doesn't want to be under God. It wants to have its own control, its own way. And speaking evil dignities is talking about, right, what that, what that means, if you break that down, is speaking about the spirit using these men to come against the righteous. To come against those that have the true glory of God in their life. I'm going to accuse you. I'm going to come with lies and I'm going to come and accuse you. Now here's the thing. Understand about accusations. When accusations come and there's no truth behind it, who's the accuser of the brethren? So you know what spirit's behind that person. Okay, we, We're not mad at the person. Whatever happened, they ha- happened. But it's a spiritual battle. But God is so good, he'll warn us where we're at and where we're headed and what's to come. And God is saying, this is where we currently stand, church. This is what's happening. Go to Judges chapter 21. Judges chapter 21. This is exactly what happens when we no longer serve the Lord, when we no longer want authority led by the Holy Spirit. One thing I know for sure, my father, our pastor, lives a righteous life. And so for me to remove myself from that, this is what happens. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. This is how we become. This is what it's speaking about here in this portion of Scripture in verse 8. Listen to what verse 9 says. And Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, which you can read in Deuteronomy, not, not bringing against him a railing accusation, but said, Lord, rebuke thee. Do you understand Michael the archangel right there, he separated himself from the devil? Because he could have accused the devil. Right? He could have used facts. He could have used truth to accuse him straight up. Right? There is no equal. I'm your equal. He could have, I mean, he could have let him have it. He could have cut him up if he wanted to. But he didn't. He raised, he humbled himself and he raised the bar at the same time. He says, I'm not going to accuse you, even though there's so many things I can accuse you of. There's so many things I can say that is truth and facts. I'm not going to accuse you, but I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. Is there anybody in this place that can say, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord? Begin to rebuke your sickness. Begin to rebuke every accusation. I rebuke every generational curse. I rebuke every foul spirit in the name of the Lord. Michael the archangel knew, I stand under authority. You might not like authority, but I'm under authority. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Our victory is found in the Lord. Verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they do not know of. Have you ever been there? Have you ever heard anything like that? Where the workings of the Holy Spirit are manifested and things are taking place and people come against it. And they call it doctrines of devils, and we don't believe in the glory of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And they're talking about this and that and visions and signs and wonders. They don't know of it. They're from a different spirit. That's why they don't know of it, so they speak evil against it. Because they don't know. It's just telling you right here. But these speak evil on those things which they do not know. But what they do know naturally, listen to this, what they do know naturally as brute beast. In those things, they corrupt themselves. Do you understand? We can't control. We can't even retain. We can't even receive things, even of the natural world, without messing ourselves up. 
You and I can only receive the things that God wants us to receive, and even some of the natural things that he wants to bless us with if we have the mind of Christ. You and I won't receive nothing without the mind of Christ. We'll mess it up, and it's saying even the natural things because they don't have the mind of Christ. No mindset at all concerning Jesus. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Someone say Cain. And ran greedily after the reward of Balaam. The heir of Balaam for reward. And perished in the ways of Korah. Now we know the story of Cain, but I want to break down three things really quick for you. It's not a three-point message. I'm going to continue. It's just three things that God spoke to me right here. I just said it. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Now, how many know that Cain killed his brother? But it started with jealousy. And because of jealousy that crept in, anger anger came in. And because of anger, he ended up murdering his brother. That's going on in the church. People are jealous of the spirit of the living God. That it's, It's because we just surrender. We're not perfect. But because the power of the Holy Ghost is in, is in the midst, they get jealous because they don't have that, because they don't want to sacrifice and let go of what we decided to let go of and say, Lord, separate me from this earth. They're trying to find a way to have the world and that with it. So they become jealous and they become angry. And what they do is they start murdering their brothers and their sisters that they call brothers and sisters at one time. They begin to come after you, come after us. This, this is the devil working, church. This is the devil But empty religion will always lead you to jealousy. Empty religion, just read the the Gospels, all the Pharisees and Sadducees mad at Jesus for everything. Always upset. And what do they do? They murdered him. Even the Christian, Hosanna, Hosanna, crucify, crucify. They murdered him. So who who are you and I? I'm nobody. You're nobody. They want to kill us or murder us, go for it. We enter into the kingdom through much, through much tribulation and trial. Let's get it on. We ain't going through nothing compared to what's happening in Afghanistan. It's not just some meme we can post and all that sounds powerful. Let me share that too, see how many likes I can get. No, there's a church actually assembling, praying they might die that night. And we have a church that can't show up because of vacation and birthday parties and, 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 and this quinceanera and this show and, and my toe. And, and I got to put a mask on. Well, COVID part two came out. What am I supposed to do? The delta's out. That's a slap in the face to the true believer. The delta's out. The coronavirus is keeping you home. I told you he released it. One thing that I've learned from the story of David, which I've been reading, we know that Saul became jealous of David. And believe me, I wish I could get physical. I really do. And so did David. But David did not touch him. David did not touch Saul. Sometimes you feel like, man, Lord, just give me one moment, Lord. Just one. I don't know what I would have done. I'm going to be transparent. I don't know what I would have done if I was David. I might have took the, the soldier's advice and said, yeah, his back's turned to us. Let's just get him now. You guys do it. You know, let me help. No. Let me be a part of it. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm trying to be real as possible. I'm not going to lie. God knows. And they ran in the era of Balaam. Anybody know the story? of? Go, go to Numbers chapter 22. Let's read it. Numbers chapter. Really, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We'll just, par- we'll just kind of go through it. Numbers chapter 22. Go to Numbers chapter 22. Here's a prophet of God that God is, I'm I'm trying to show you something what's happening in the the world, church world. Here's a prophet that God is using, that God raised up and God is using. And what happens is he, he aligns himself with an evil king. And this evil king wants wants to curse the children of God. And he knows he can't do it, but he has to get a prophet in his place to curse them. And listen to what happens here in verse 12 of of chapter 22. And God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people for they are blessed. How many know that the devil can't curse what God calls blessed? 
You and I are a blessed people. I don't care what curses come, what accusations come. They can go back to where they came from in the name of Jesus. He raised up a standard against it. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said to the, to the prince of, of, of Balak, Get you into your land, and the Lord refuseth to give me and leave me with you. God already told him not to go. He's telling him not to go. Don't be a part of what they're doing. And this is what's happening. We have these passive men, these, 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 these neutered generation type of men that call themselves men of God. And what they do, they align themselves with the devil. And God tells them not to do it, and they do it anyway, willfully do it. He even repents in this portion of Scripture. He repents, and he still goes and does it. But listen to what happens here. Jump down with me to verse 16. These are the, th- 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 these are the priests, or the princes, listen, the prince, that came. Listen, and they came to Balaam, and they said to him, thus says, thus says Balak, not God. Thus is this man, this king here on, here on the earth, this king that you're under, or this king that you aligned yourself with. Let nothing I pray thee, he, they're using Christian words. I pray thee, oh, he must be a godly man because he prays. He's saying, I pray thee. He says, I pray thee, hinder thee that you would come to me. He's telling them, I want you to disobey what the Lord is telling you directly as a man of God, someone that knows truth. But I'm asking you to follow me and disobey what God. I pray you do. I pray that I can change your mind. It's heavy. My Lord. Now listen to this. For I will promote thee. Someone go like this. Just do that for me. Come help me out. I will promote thee unto every great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou say unto me. Come, therefore, again, I pray thee, curse me these people. He wants Balaam to help him curse God's people, God's children. And he says, I will promote you. I'll honor you. You'll be my best friend. You never had that before, so I'm going to go ahead and just give you the little carrot, dangle the carrot. And I, and I pray that you come. Help me curse the, 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 the true righteousness of God. All for promotion. And Balaam answered and said unto him, unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Meaning if you, if you give me the riches, if you make me your best friend, and you promote me and honor me and give me the money and the wealth that I'm looking for, okay, I'll do it. I'll go with you. Long story short, we know about the donkey. I don't want to go there because it says a bunch of, I'll read it. You know what I mean? The donkey, God uses the donkey to actually save his life. He uses a donkey. Use another donkey. He'll use the foolishness of the world to confound the wise. He used a donkey to turn away from the angel of the Lord or else he would have killed him and saved the donkey. That's how much God loved him, even though he was rebellious. So God says, I'm going to turn it all the way around for my good. Go with him. But what I put in your mouth, you're going to prophesy. And so he gives him the word of the Lord, and and three times he prophesies over the children of Israel. And what happens is he prophesies blessings. And the king's upset. What are you doing? You said you're going to help me curse them. Now you're blessing them? He says, I can't help but speak what the Lord puts into my mouth. It was the Lord. But listen to what happens. He says, I'm going to take your promotion. You're not going to be be popular anymore. I'm going to take your fans. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take your money, my house. You're not having none of that. So Balaam says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know how to curse the children of Israel. So now they go into a plan to come against the righteous, to come against the children of Israel. He says, if you release women from Moab and you let them go into the camp, the young men will fornicate. And because of fornication and idolatry and adultery, because what takes place, God will have to bring judgment. And this is what happens. They they devise a plan to come against the children of God. And could I tell you, the enemy's out to kill, steal, and destroy my life and your life and this church. So jealousy because of Cain and greed because of Balaam. 
and the rebellion of Korah. Do you want me to read that to you? Okay, go to Numbers chapter 16. Thank you, Mom. You said yes, so. Numbers chapter 16. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon ye, seeing the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves upon the congregation of the Lord. He's upset. Korah's upset because he was of a priesthood, but of a different priesthood. He wasn't from the Aaron's priesthood. And so he, God gave him a ministry, but he wasn't happy with that. He wanted something greater. And he was mad at Moses and Aaron. For the, You're lifting yourself up for the congregation. He wanted what they had. He wanted their authority. He wanted to have the main voice in a different spirit. And when Moses, and when Moses heard this, he fell upon his face because he knew now judgment's coming. You're crazy, Korah. He falls upon his face and he spoke unto Korah unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near. Unto him, even him who hath chosen, will he cause to come near to him. Meaning God's going to come down now. And when he comes down, he's coming with love, but also judgment. And this is a, you're the one that called this upon yourself. You're the one that said you, this is what you wanted to do. You want to get the congregation, the people be uh, against the man of God and against the righteousness of God? Well, now the judgment's coming. Right. I'm not sure if this is making sense. I'm getting filled again. It's kind of glories in this place. Man, I'm getting stirred again. This do, take your censers and Korah and all his company and put the fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall that man whom the Lord doeth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon the sons of Levi. Go down to verse 19. And Korah gathered all the congregation against him into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Against them. You see what he's doing? He has his own people now. And he's coming against Moses, he's coming against the congregation with his own congregation. Those that are listening, those that are deceived, those that are double-minded, those that want promotion, those that are of a different spirit. Easily sifted out, easily. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto the congregation. Woo! And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, separate yourselves. He's talking to you and I. We have to be willing to separate ourselves, church. Don't be around the wrong crowd, the wrong gossip. I don't care what your mama, your daddy, your brother, your uncle, your grandma, your sister, your brother. Separate yourself because if not, the longer you sit under the deception, you will start accepting it. What you allow to lead you, you begin to lead with. Separate yourself from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And what does Moses do? He begins to pray again for the people. He fell upon his face and said, O oh God, God of all the spirits of all the flesh, shall one man sin and wrath the whole congregation? Meaning you're going to bring wrath upon everybody because of one man? Moses is praying, Lord, please don't do that. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, speaking to the congregation saying, get up. Someone say, get up. Yeah. From the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. And so Moses arose up and, and went to Dathan and Abram, and the elders followed him. And he spoke unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents or from the covering of the wicked men. He says, Remove yourself, depart from under the covering of these wicked men. I'm this is the warning of the Lord. Help me, Jesus. And touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed with all their sins. Not just your sins, but all their sins. Because once you accept one thing, you're accepting it all. And Moses said, hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all the works, for I have not done them of my own mind. Listen to what he says. If these men die a common death of all men, or if they visited after the visitation of all them, then the Lord hath not sent me. Meaning there's not going to be a nice burial for these men. There's not going to be flowers and a nice little tombstone and, and you can come and bring flowers and candles. No, 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 no. There's not going to be none of that. Because if there is, then the Lord hasn't sent me. And then he begins to prophesy right here. But if the Lord make a new thing on the earth, open her mouth and swallow them up. With all, all that is unto them, 
and they go down quick into the pit, them shall understand that those men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made at the end, speaking of all these words, that the ground clave asunder and was under them. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that apprehend, that appertained unto Korah and all of their goods. This is what God is, this is what God has released. We're speaking about judgment. We're speaking about I can't help but prophesy. You and I need to pray now more than ever. You and I need to declare victory and salvation and protection now more than ever. Why do you think, I, I, it's, it's kind of coming to me now that we even took communion. We took communion. We're covered. Those that were here and you took communion part two. It was a glorious time in this service. God marked our building. God marked our houses. He marked our marriages, our families. So the jealousy of Cain he's talking about is, is present the greed of, of, of Balaam is, is present. The rebellion of Korah is present. And listen to what he says here in verse 12 of, of Jude. These are the spots. How many know God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle? He says, these are the spots in your feast of charity that are coming against what? The, the love of Jesus Christ. It doesn't want love. It wants hatred. It wants division. It wants bitterness. It wants jealousy. So the spots are in the church or in the congregations coming against the love of God. They might not tell you. They might say they love you. I'm going to promote you. I'm going to honor you. Feeding themselves without fear. Selfishness without fear. They'll even come and take communion. They'll even read the scripture of communion with no fear. And partake themselves. No fear at all. Clouds. They are without water. Listen to this. Carried about with winds. Trees whose fruit wither. Without fruit. Twice dead. Plucked up by the roots. How many know clouds without water are meaningless? Right? Life-giving rain come in clouds. But how many know clouds, they look good because they're at a high level. They look nice, but if they don't bring no, no life-giving rain, that, that means they're holding back the Holy Spirit. They're holding back the works of God. They're holding back the rain. It's a cloud. It looks nice. All those clouds are meant for is blocking the sun. And that's what they're doing. They're blocking Jesus. They're blocking the workings of the Holy Ghost, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are men in positions. The devil is taking up position in a high place. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and darkness in heavenly places. Because it looks like a cloud. That's a beautiful cloud. It brings no fruit, no rain, no nothing. It's withholding it all. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame so it looks good like an ocean it's moving that church is rocking that place is rocking that that pastor's rocking but it says the foam that comes to the to the seashore all the dirt and all the muck and all the mire and all the seaweed and all the dirt and all the shame that's what it really looks like wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever you ever seen a shooting star, how powerful and beautiful it looks? Or even a firework, boom, boom, boom. And then when it's gone, there was no sign that it was there. It looked oh, look at that. They're good. Okay, it's gone forever. This is what's happening. Go to Ezekiel 37. We're done. God has called his church to prophesy. I can't help but prophesy. We better begin to pray. We better begin to declare the word of the Lord. I can have the team come back up. It's 833. Everybody's good, right? We know this portion of scripture, the valley of dry bones, but, I, but before we can begin to prophesy and before you and I can be, begin to hear the word of the Lord and begin to let it take up root and become engrafted in our lives, go to Ezekiel chapter 2. It's powerful. Ezekiel, see, the, the Holy Spirit just didn't rest on him. It entered in him. Woo, 
I'm talking about. I can't help but prophesy. It's a working of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, listen to how Jesus, or the Father, set him up. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand up on thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me. When he spake unto me, and he set my feet, he set, upon, he set me upon my feet, that I heard him speak unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to the rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are imprudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are, to re, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of every manner, neither be afraid of their words. Though bears and thorns be with thee, and doest dwell among the scorpions, be not afraid, he's saying, of their words, or be dismayed at their looks. Though they are, re they are a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak the words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. He says it again. For they are the most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not therefore rebellious like that, rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat what I give to thee. Right there, he, he gets a scroll. He gets the word of the Lord. God begins to feed him heavenly manna. He begins to be able to prophesy and speak what God. He says, don't re if I'm asking you to do something, don't rebel like them. Don't go in the ways of Korah. Don't, don't. You need to listen to what I'm asking you to speak. You need to listen to what I'm asking you to do. It's not going to be popular. They're going to look at you crazy. There might be some things, some accusations and persecutors coming against you. Don't be rebellious like them. Stand out. God is asking his church to stand out and begin to prophesy. Verse chapter 37, we're done here. And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit. Hallelujah. Isn't, doesn't that sound good? Just carry me, Lord, in your spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of dry bones. In a valley of dry bones. And caused me to pass by around me and beheld there were many, very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. Is there a possibility there's death in our lives? We're dry in our lives because who we're around? There was a valley of dry. How come the bones in front or behind or beside them couldn't prophesy to them? Because they were just as dead as they were. Are we taking counsel from, 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 from those that are, that are worse than us or in, in their own mess, in their own sin, in their own confusement? And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Could I ask you something? The situation, the things that you and I are going through, the things that we currently see and what we feel, can they live? Yeah. And I answered, oh Lord God, thou knowest. That's the right answer. But you see, he has a relationship with the Lord. I can go by what I see. I can go by what I feel. But Lord, what are you saying? Lord, you know, so tell me. Oh, you ain't hearing me. That's powerful. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones. And now he tells them, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay upon you and bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And I prophesied there and there was a noise. And behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to bone. And this is powerful. But it's just amazing how he was able to prophesy what the word of the Lord was. He didn't speak of his own accord. He went to the Father. God gave him direction, and he prophesied that, and things began to happen. This is what I'm saying, church. How come things ain't happening? 
Do, can we hear the word of the Lord? Can we hear the voice of God? Can we, can we accept the challenge and begin to prophesy to the dry places? Because God is looking for a remnant, a true church, to be that voice like John the Baptist in the wilderness, declaring the return of Jesus, preparing the way of the Lord. Now I'm going to read these over you. You can stand to your feet. I could keep going there, but I'm going to stop. But I'm serious when I say that I've been, re- I've, been, I've been praying Scripture now more than ever. It's never been this way, and I'm thankful, God. I am thankful. Because every morning when I get up, that flesh is right there. <laughs> that flesh is right there, man, willing to take someone out. You know what I mean? Let's just be real. I'm just being real. Am I the only one that thinks that way? I'll just take you out and be done with it. Like, Thank you, Dad. That's my father-in-law telling you right there. He's one, he's a, hey, right? I, I'm looking over my shoulder my back. I'll just take him out and be done with it. It's the ways of the devil, the workings of the flesh. But anything done in the flesh is of witchcraft, of a different spirit. I've been reading Psalms, and my wife gave me this scripture in Psalms chapter 5, and I I have my own that I've been reading, actually a few of them, Psalms chapter 142. You can read all kinds of of Psalms. And uh, I'm I'm praying, I'm praying for vindication, for truth. Has nothing to do with my name, has nothing to do with your name, this building's name, this church's name. It has to do with truth. Because Jesus is coming back, and there are men and women that have left that we've done ministry with our whole life. There are people falling away, people that 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 are no longer a part of who we are. It's the working of the devil. So I'm praying these prayers. Psalms chapter 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King, my God. For unto thee I will pray. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. And I will look up, for thou art a God that hath pleasure, that has not pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall the evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will arbor the bloody and deceitful men. But as for me, I will come into thy house in a multitude of mercy. And in thy fear, I will worship toward thy holy temple. Woo! I just want to cry right there. Your mercies, God, are too good. Man, his mercies is too good. And because of, man, the fear of the Lord is the beginning to know him, church. I will worship towards your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sculpture that they flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own consoles. Cast them out in the multitude of the transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Come on, church. There should be a shout of praise. There should be a noise. There should be a rejoicing. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defended them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteousness with favor. And you will compass him with a shield. Now, God gave me this next, just so you can bow your heads and close your eyes. I want this to sink into your spirit. Because how important it is to pray the word of the Lord. And, and yes, this is scriptural, so yes, we can pray this. We want the Lord to go to war. We don't have to go to war. The Lord is our is our defender. But in chapter 7, listen to what it says here. Arise, O Lord, in thy anger. Lift up thyself because of rage of my enemies. And awake me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about. For their sakes, therefore return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Listen to what he says. But judge me. See, Titus talked about it. We can say this and that, and, and it's your fault, and it's your, you're the one slandering. You're the one that's doing this. You're the one that's accusing. But what about our part? And David had 
a pure heart. David had a contrite spirit before the Lord. And this is powerful. He says, but judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is within me. A double portion. Elisha was asking for the double portion of his character, of the integrity of the man of God. I want double. He says, judge me for my integrity when no one's around. When I'm upset, when it's just me and my wife or me and my kids, and what are we saying, and what are we, judge me for that too, Lord. Don't just judge them, but judge me. Woo, if you ain't hearing me, that's powerful. Because we can pray all we want. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous of God trieth the hearts and reigns. My defense is my God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. So you see, God's, God's a God of war. He's, his sword is ready. His arrows are ready. He's ready to go to war on our behalf. But you and I can't stand in this place. You and I can't stand and say, Lord, I'm just perfect. None is perfect. Lord, forgive us for our iniquities. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our slander, our gossip, for our accusations. For even speaking truth, but in a hateful manner. He made a pit and digged it, and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. I believe God already spoke. God has called a church to be able to listen to the voice of the Lord, to be able to listen to what heaven is declaring, to walk in obedience to what the Lord is saying. For us to get our lives right before the Lord so we can be used as living vessels, pure, a, 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 a living sacrifice unto the Lord, holy and acceptable. So then, and only then, can we begin to prophesy. And see the work of the Lord declared and see the work of the Lord established. But you and I have to come to that place and say, Lord, that's me. Forgive me, God. I want to be used. I want to see souls saved. I want to see those that left come back and begin to prophesy. But it has to be from a pure, genuine heart. If God spoke to you tonight in any way, I can't help but prophesy. I want you to come. Just come out of your chair. Thank you for joining us at Remnant Church Modesto. If you would like to receive Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life back to him, we would like to lead you in a prayer. Just repeat after me. Jesus, I come before you as a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead on the third day. Come into my life and lead me in your truth from now on. In your name I pray, amen. This is the start of your Christian walk, and we would love to connect with you. So thanks again for joining us. We would like to remind you that we have our services every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. We would love for you to join us. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at Remnant Church Modesto. Hope to see you soon. God bless.